In fact, we have a team of people, but more often than not, it's, it's Leah Hirschfeld who joins us and she's joining us right now. She is from the research and development team at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and we're so thrilled to have her with us. Good morning, Leah. Good morning. Good morning. I hope I can follow that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and I could go on and on because we've so enjoyed over the last year or so you joining us to sort of explain things to us. And I know a couple of weeks ago, we put a couple of things, well, a couple in the last couple of months, we put some things in your column and said, gave you assignments and said, go find out more about this. So what is, what are we hearing about today? Yeah. Um, so I, at first, let me say, I love when I get assignments, it takes the pressure off me. And then I know I'm actually addressing something that your, your audience really wants to hear. So anyone watching, anyone listening or watching later on, on all of those different formats that Shannon mentioned, um, write in, tell us what you want to hear about and we'll make sure we address it. Um, but today we're going to talk about the gut and microbiome. Um, and it's very exciting, very sexy, which is not something I thought I'd ever say about gut and microbiome, but it is. <laughs> um, and before I quickly get into that, I'll, I'll um, you know, Shannon already, Shannon and Nancy already kind of addressed who I am. But um, like they said, I'm Leah. I'm a research coordinator at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Um, I work on our research and development team. Um, and like Nan Nancy and Shannon already said, that that's a really cool team, um, if I say so ourselves. Um, we get to kind of make sure that we're addressing the best way to provide therapy with empirical research for our clients, for our caregivers. Um, and so we spend our day analyzing data, running research experiments, trying to parse together what all the research that's coming out is showing. Um, and I'm so excited that we get to also be on Autism Live to, to uh, talk about it. It's really cool. <laughs> so you say this is sexy research what makes it that um well so so there's you know i i, I think this is pretty w wide in the research community but um you call research sexy when it's like hot and new and lots of money are being thrown around mm -hmm. um so you know at one point sexy was like bilingual research um gut and microbiome is definitely sexy everyone kind of wants a part of it everyone thinks it's really exciting there is tons of money being thrown into it right now. Um, and that's really cool and exciting. You know, there's a lot of awareness going on that GI issues are a common complaint for autistic individuals. Um, and it's way more common than individuals with, that are typically developing. Um, so some researchers have said it's as much as 90% of autistic individuals have GI complaints. Um, others say, you know, two to three times more than typically developing peers. Um, and what that kind of points to is that there may be something interacting here between the gut and maybe the brain. And that's kind of maybe there's a solution where we address the genetics that cause gut issues and brain concerns. And we can help target some of those symptoms that, that are related to autism. Um, but at the moment, there's nothing definitive. Um, so understanding that GI dysfunction is where we're, we're getting at, but there's nothing here yet that's super definitive. And this is like a spoiler alert for everyone. Um, but that the complaints of GI distress has increased. So like I said, the fact that there's so much research out there saying there are GI issues is something that our families and our patients can potentially run with um, as we wait for all of the second research to come out. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to spiel, spiel this right now. Um, but um, like I said, there's a lot of awareness for GI issues. Um, and if you're a caregiver or a parent or a patient trying to advocate for themselves, um, one of the things that you can make sure you do is go to your doctor and talk to them about any GI complaints you think you're, you have or your child has. Um, and really, you know, there are some folks who might push that off and say it's just a side effect of having an ASD diagnosis. That is, yeah, that's probably not um, the best way to resolve it. And we can really push to make sure that we're having some solutions um, and that we're addressing any GI concerns, right? So that, you know, you can, there's over-the-counter medication, there's diet, there's exercise, there's uh, sleep, there's water. There's a lot of things that we can do to kind of address those GI concerns as we wait for the research to come out. Um, and we've seen that, you know, and, and I, I'll talk for myself when I have GI issues, I am a cranky mess. Like I am not pleasant. Um, and I, I, and I'm sure that is true with everyone who has GI issues. So if you're resolving your GI issues, your child, your, yourself, whoever, 
may experience um, behavioral solutions and better outcomes. Um, and that may lead to some additional outcomes of like being able to learn quicker, being able to really focus on your lessons, things like that. Um, so you really want to talk to your pediatricians um, or your doctors and also talk to your ABA clinicians. You know, um, your ABA clinicians can absolutely help to make sure that um, if like you, you think someone needs a better diet or more variety to help with GI complaints, your AB, ABA clinicians can absolutely help with food selectivity and things, with getting enough water, which making with, with adding an exercise regime, all of those things, you know, between your doctor and your ABA clinician, you can help with those GI issues, again, as we wait for the research. Um, and another thing can do if they're interested. Um, so I'm going to throw in fecal transplants here. Um, also very exciting. A lot of people are, I think, a bit kind of the same vein as medical, uh, as marijuana right now, cannabis. You know, very exciting stuff, but very experimental. Um, one study talking about those headlines, Shannon, one study just came out a few months ago, I think, that um, showed some positive outcomes for fecal transplants. But there's a lot of, um, you know, you have to be a little hesitant here. It, those studies still need a lot of replication. Um, though a lot of those studies are still in the infancy, so they don't necessarily have a control group, which means, you know, there's no comparison between the two groups. Um, and, and there's also no clear indication of like how placebo effect might um, affect individuals. So for those watching, um, placebo effect is you think you're getting a treatment and so you feel better, regardless of if you're getting the treatment or not, knowing that you're getting something or thinking that you're getting will get a placebo effect and you'll feel better. Um, so all those studies are really cool and exciting, but they're still really in their infancy. And I would I would caution anyone of either trying anything like that at home or, or maybe even trying it with a doctor. What I would recommend is talk to your doctor, see if it's appropriate, and then see if you wanna get into a clinical study. There's a lot of clinical studies out there that are working with fecal transplants. They definitely need more, more um, participants. You can look at clinicaltrials.gov. You can research, uh, reach out to research at centerforautism.com. We'll help you navigate that, that world. Um, and know your rights as a research participant. Research is always voluntary. You can bow out at any time. There's neg no negative consequences to you. Um, and you also have to have an informed consent. So you have to make sure that uh, the researchers have to make sure that they provide you all of the information before you start a study. So you are very aware of, your, of, of everything going on. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in kind of working on that experimental stuff going on, I would highly recommend you work with clinical trials, talk to your doctor, talk to your ABA clinicians, um, talk to your clinicians and talk to your doctors about any GI issues that you see with your child or anyone else. They, uh, there is a prevalence for GI issues with autistic individuals um, and people are getting much more aware of that, which is cool um, because you're not just going to hopefully get pushed off. And if you do, we can give you research um, that really says, no, no, like this is a serious concern. Um, and you may see results. Um, you probably are not going to see recovery results necessarily from solving GI issues, um, but you might see behavioral outcomes or quality of life outcomes. People might sleep better. People might feel better. Um, and then the other last thing I wanted to plug was, um, Shannon, I know I think last time when we were talking about this, you had asked about um, a giant grant that I think maybe autism yes. Yeah, it got exactly um, speaks. It was autism speaks. Yes. Autism speaks. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you asked me to follow up, so I did. Um, and it looks like we don't have results yet. Um, it looks like that data is still being analyzed, and a lot of that data, unfortunately, gets pushed because of everything that happened with COVID. Um, yeah. So there is some delay in, in looking at it, and it's a lot of data. Um, and this is true, I'm gonna say also about a lot of the research right now. So like I said, sexy, sexy research, you're gonna see a lot of headlines about million dollar grants, literally million dollar grants being yeah. thrown at this. Um, but they're being awarded this year, middle of last year, which unfortunately means we probably won't see research results for at least another year or two at the end of 2020. Wow. I would be shocked if we don't, if we see something before mid end 2021, research just takes so long and that's true too if you end up in a clinical trial you might find out results for yourself but you might not find out results for the group or see published results for at least a year or something like that um but there is cool work going on and i'm really excited about the future um and 
In the meantime, please talk to your, your doctors. Please talk to your ABA clinicians. Get everyone on board and say, you know, I see them clutching their stomach a lot. Or, you know, they're on the toilet for a really long time trying to have a bowel movement. Like, there are other activities that we can do as we wait to kind of figure out what that genetic connection might be between ASD and the gut biome. Okay, so let me see if I can... If, if I encapsulate this, that what we what we have found out is that the prevalence of it, it's very prevalent, but we don't know why. And all the money being spent, we don't have the results back. But here's what's weird for me is that I think it's the, the worst of both possible worlds, because I think a lot of us have experienced going to the doctor and saying my kid has gut issues and they dismiss it and say that it is autism. And it's nowhere on the criteria for autism. And, and yet, so we're saying it's very prevalent, but then they say, oh, well, that's just autism. And it isn't. They should still be treating the gut issues. So we just have to be more diligent is what you're telling us, that we've got to fight for people to listen to us. And if we're, if, I would say if we're at a doctor where they're not listening to us, it's time to get a new doctor. And I know that's hard. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's spot on. Um, there are the prevalence it seems to be huge that that individuals are having GI, and your doctor should not just push you off and say, "Oh, it's fine, just a symptom of ASD." There's things that people can do. You can absolutely work on resolving the GI issues, and, and God forbid it's anything more serious. But you know, you can work on making sure you have enough water, have a variety of diet, have exercise, whatever it is, and your doctor should be supporting you in that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I, you know, I'm glad that we got this update. We in fact had had Nancy, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, we had on the, the lead doctor who was doing the fecal transplant study out of Arizona or New Mexico, yeah. I want to say, uh -huh. and it was, they were just in the early stages, but um, it was very exciting because fecal transplant is not something that's new. Mm -hmm. I, I um, I mean, people have been doing it even within their insurance companies, adults have been doing it. I think what was a little bit different um, for the fecal transplant study in Arizona, if I remember correctly, because I, I know a, <laughs> I know someone, they used to work on the show, that their, their mother was someone who had been doing fecal transplants for uh, over a decade, for adults. Um, and, uh, and so she was like, oh yeah, that's a very, it's not quite mainstream, but even your insurance was, you know, if you, if you were an adult and were having a certain kind of GI issue, they would do it, but it was a transplant that was given rectally. And what they were doing in Arizona that was, I think, really controversial and that was grossing us out was that they were giving it orally. Yes. And, and right. that was the thing that we were like, oh my goodness, I, can't, <laughs> I, I must look away. Um, but they were like, they were doing all these things to separate out what it was that they wanted to, to give the transplant to. And then they were giving it in this like milkshake container mm -hmm. and I couldn't even look. I just, uh, but you no, know, the, not, I mean, it sounds gross, but this, the, oh. the, um, stool sample is, um, put through a process where it does not yeah. look and, and it's sanitized and, it's but it's the, yeah. but it's the enzymes or the, I don't know what that's in it that is preserved that they, and, and I guess, as I recall, cause it's been like two years ago, that part of the issue was that doing it rectally, it would only recolonize the good bacteria in the lower part of the colon and they really wanted to get in the small intestine of our kids because they were seeing that that made a much better uh, outcome. So I find it interesting, Nancy, I, you know, this is a very sensitive subject, but, and I don't know that Wyatt would appreciate us talking about this, nor would my son, but did Wyatt have gastrointestinal issues? Yes, he did until he was put on the gluten-free, dairy-free diet. And if he consumes dairy, he has a lot of intestinal issues. Yeah. And, and same thing with my child. He would not appreciate me talking about this, but um, I would say that my entire family is, you know, we have a very interesting um, gastrointestinal history. So, um, and, but he's super sensitive and even, you know, at this point he's still gluten-free, casein-free. And it was last year at this time 
that he said, can we do, every once in a while, he'll say, can we do a dairy challenge, mom? And we, we did a dairy challenge. She ate cheese for two days in reasonable amounts, not like, you know, tons of it. And I said, you can eat it for two days. And at the end of the first day, he said to me, can we stop? I don't want to do it. I, it tasted so good, but I can't do this. I'm in so much pain. I don't feel good. I don't want to feel this way ever again in my life. So, you know, um, that was so, so powerful to me right. that, you know, he was, so he was 16 at the time and he was like, I can't, I don't want to do this, mom. I can't. Um, and I was like, well, you know, then yes, let's stop it. So I can't imagine, you know, that's what he was saying when he was 16 and verbal, he wasn't able to tell me when he was three and I was giving him macaroni and cheese. Right. Right. Um, but I was seeing behavior that I was like, what's happening. Mm -hmm. I can't, I, we can't live our lives this way. You know, what am I supposed to do? And when we took him off of the gluten and the, the milk, we saw a different child, a different child. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say that I don't think that that solved all of his gastrointestinal issues. And I think that people need to be aware of that, but it isn't just diet. There are other things as well, but um, the diet certainly helped with a lot of different things. And you said that too previously, haven't you, Nancy? Yes. The diet helped with behaviors as well and yeah. includes in language and other things that um you know we saw was pretty apparent to the to the naked eye so um and we have a viewer who's what who's been watching and i know had checked in the other day and said that their child went dairy free and she said so far the no dairy has been absolutely uh, awesome and somebody else said, I can tell when my son has a yeast issue, he smells different, behavior is off. I, you know, and I think um, diet can can be a very important, important thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I it used to make me so mad in the early days of our intervention when um, people would say diet has nothing to do with it. And and I would just be so frustrated. I would go, well, then by all means, drink drink this beer and tell me how well you can perform afterwards in, in your daily, you know, routines. Let's see if it changes at all. Of course, what you put in your stomach or don't put in your stomach makes a difference. But I always think back to, um, I'm allergic to milk and I'm allergic to wheat. And I remember, I want to say it was 1984, uh, that Phil Donahue, this is how old I am, uh, but you can search it up because it's available on YouTube. You guys, Phil Donahue had on his show, it was considered very unethical at the time, but it was, it changed my mind. Uh, he had a group of kids that were in his studio and you could see them playing and they were interacting and they were just, you know, kids and everything was fine. But he knew uh, because the parents had told them that these kids were kids who were reactive to milk. I don't know, allergy or whatever, but they were reactive to milk. So they gave all the kids some milk and went to a commercial break and came back and it was bedlam. The kids were screaming and yelling and crying and, and you know, that kind of crying when they mm -hmm. like, they're so out of control. And it was, it was eight minutes later. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, this is what milk does to some kids. And I remember going, holy business, you know, and again, highly unethical. We don't give things to children that we know are going to make them reactive, but he changed my mind that day. And, uh, you know, I, I, whenever somebody says to me, oh, I don't think it can make that big of a difference. I'm like, take a look. It's there. The video is there. Somebody else is same here. My son is GFCF and he uh, has helped him with his language as well as behavior, completely different kid. And I feel the need to say, disclaimer, it's not all kids. I mm -hmm. also know people who have done the gluten-free, casein-free diet and did not see any behavior change, did wow. not see, you know, their child's gastrointestinal stuff better, did not see any, you know, and I think that's been part of the problem when trying to get science um, and you folks, you researchers to see, because they'll take 10 kids and mm -hmm. they'll put them on the gluten-free, casein-free diet. And, you know, maybe six of them don't have a big difference. And so, and, and four of them do, and they come back and they go, well, statistically, you know, it's, it's not likely, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. It's been crazy making for those of us who have seen a difference in our kids. Right. Um, and, and to that point, too, it's hard then to make a recommendation where, okay, everyone on, who's autistic should go on 
gluten free? Not necessarily, but it yeah. could absolutely make a difference. Um, and I'll make a plug there. I don't, I don't know necessarily, but I know, you know, there are um, allergy tests and things that you can do that if that's maybe why there are GI eye issues and it'll show up on an allergy test, absolutely your doctor can run that. And I don't think that that should be such a big hurdle to ask for an allergy test. If you have um, insurance, you can certainly ask for an allergy test. It's something that's pretty run of the mill. The issue is going to be that there are different types of allergy tests. And there are some, there's the, Nancy, you might know, there's the AGA and the, the AGE. And, you know, some of them are more definitive than others. But I will say that we did get my son tested and he did not come back mm. as someone who was reactive to milk or to gluten. Right. But so because. It's not, it's not something they're going to show a reaction to in an yes. allergy test. But I will say it showed us other things that he was allergic to, which yeah. helped us, right? Okay. And and because because of my history um, of being allergic to wheat and to dairy, we made the decision to put him on the GFC. Because I, at that point, we were waiting for ABA to start, and I was like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. I, what like what's in my arsenal? What can I possibly do to be helping my child? Right. And and you know, and so that we said, well, let's just try it. Um, it's, it's not going to hurt him. I, I know that people worry about, will your child get enough calcium? But, you know, my child was eating green leafy vegetables. I think if your child won't eat green leafy vegetables, you have to look at what your calcium sources are and make sure that your child's getting enough calcium. Calcium is important for growing bone, bones, but I have a child who's six foot two. Um, and he has been gluten-free, casein-free since he was three. It is, it is doable. I want everybody to know that it is doable. Shannon, how did you find out you were uh, gluten and casein intolerant? Well, you know what? I was uh, dairy um, allergic to dairy as a child. As a baby, uh -huh. they diagnosed me as being allergic to milk. And mm -hmm. so my mother had me on soy formula when mm -hmm. I was a baby. And then later as a child, I, I would eat sandwiches, you know, I eat Wonder Bread and I um, drank milk, but I constantly had all these allergy issues and um, a lot of health problems as a result of it. And so my mother finally, they said, you know, you should probably take her to an allergist. So I was probably 12 mm -hmm. when they officially tested me. Now, the irony of this was that my brother, uh, my younger brother, constantly had allergy issues and ended up in an oxygen tent twice a year. So they had done all the allergy testing on him, but it never occurred to them to test me as his sister. So 12 years old, they did the allergy testing and said, Oh, you're allergic to milk. And, um, and I don't think they tested me for wheat. Then I discovered it later on. There was a, there was a book, Dr. Berger, um, who was a big allergist in New York city, put out a series of books about how many people have hidden allergies and that you can be just slightly allergic to something, but it can throw you off at different times of the year. And that's exactly what I had at that point and still have that in the spring and in the fall, when things are, you know, mold and things are flourishing, I struggle. And that if the tighter I am on my allergy diet during those times, the healthier I am. And if I'm not tight on my allergy diet, I lose it. So I did his elimination diet mm. and discovered that I was horribly reactive to wheat um, and then subsequently have been tested for that. But in the, but I, there were years I went back to eating milk and it was two years ago that I did another allergy panel and came back allergic to milk, allergic to wheat. I'm allergic to beef and pork, but I'm, you know, now I'm vegan, but I was vegetarian for years. So I don't eat those. But the other thing that was a ginormous bummer is I'm allergic to bananas. And I, I expect everyone to cry for me. That is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, but I wouldn't have known that. And I was eating bananas. And I was eating yogurt and not feeling well. I do think it's important that we do get our kids tested for allergies. When, when we had Jem tested, we found out that he was allergic to almonds. And mm. all, um, any kind of a nut allergy, it's really important that you be aware of those because those can get bad fast. So I, I am a big fan of getting tested. 
And I'll throw in, you know, Shannon, you mentioned that you, your son luckily loves leafy greens and, and so calcium was not a problem, but that's again, where you can talk to your ABA clinicians. Um, there is tons of research and they have tons of strategies to make sure that um, food selectivity, if that's your concern as a parent or a caregiver, you can, we can work on that um, and really make sure. And I've seen it work like kids who used to be picky now eat basically everything. They're better eaters than I am. Um, so that's something we can definitely, you know, talk to your ABA clinician. That's something we can definitely work on if that's a concern, especially if that impacts GI. There's so many behavioral implications. So that that's really cool. Well, one of the things that I've heard often is uh, both in the autism community and outside the autism community is if there's something that you or your child are eating, that it's your main thing. Like if all your child will eat is nachos, that, it, it, you know, with the, the corn things and the, the cheese over the top, it is more likely, whatever you're addicted to is more likely to be the thing that you are having an allergy to. Right, yes. Right? I that. And that I makes it hard. craved dairy and carbohydrates when he was allergic. Yeah. To, when he oh. had reactions to gluten location. But that's oh. what, all he craved. And in the beginning of doing the diet, we just used replacement foods, cheese that was non-dairy cheese, non-dairy uh tortillas, I mean, gluten-free tortillas, things like mm -hmm. that. So we were still, he was still craving and thinking he was getting the actual food. Yeah. And listen, if, you know, the things that I fantasize about being able to eat are like French bread and butter pecan ice cream. And mm -hmm. to me, you know, that's death on a stick. But I want, <laughs> I want to say that, you know, what happens when you have a child, a lot of fear that the parents have, and they go, well, my child only eats chicken nuggets and French fries. So I'm not going to be able to do your gluten-free casein-free thing. My child will cease to exist. And, and none of us are advocating starving your child, right? But a lot of people have discovered that when you, rem when you put a gluten-free nugget in, and I've got a great gluten-free nugget for you, when you put those in, then all of a sudden your child will eat a leafy green because you're breaking that addiction and they, they can taste other things and they like them. So, um, but there, if, if you have here, it's Ralph's, but in a lot of the world, it's Kroger there. It Purdue sells a gluten-free chicken strip nugget. That's in your deli section, like not by the lunch meat. It, they're organic. Now they're gluten-free. They are chicken nuggets. And my little nieces who are not gluten reactive, who are not on a GFCF diet, that is their favorite nugget now because they've had them at Aunt Shannon's house. So I'm telling you, they are, they are better than your gluten-infused chicken nuggets, and they're organic. Yeah, so we get the dinosaur oh. chicken, the Wilshire Farms dinosaur chicken. But I got to be honest, those are super expensive. Yeah. And these Purdue ones are less, they're still expensive, let's be honest, but they're not as expensive as some of the other ones. Because sometimes you get those little boxes of the gluten-free chicken nuggets and it's like five portions and it's $10. <sighs> uh, and at our grocery stores carry the, these Purdue, um, the chicken nuggets. I might ask Jim to go get one out of the refrigerator to show you. But um Every once in a while, they put them on sale, and we always stock up on them. So get me talking about food, ladies, and it's all over. Uh, so people are writing in saying, same here. My son is GF. Let me go. Uh, my son is GF, CF. I, I got to find it over here. And it has helped with language as well as behavior. Completely different kid. Someone else says, wish my husband would try dairy gluten-free would help him. You know, at one point we had two of our therapists on our team decided to go gluten-free, casein-free for 30 days with Jem as, as solidarity. And guess what? Both of them felt better. One of them discovered by the end of the month that they were um, celiac mm -hmm. and said to me, you may have just saved my life. I, I can't, I can't tell you how much different I feel. Uh, somebody wants to know what's this Nemechek protocol all these parents are doing. I haven't even Googled it because it sounds sort of far out. Um, and, uh, and somebody else said that's like Bell Evans. You get three in the box. Yes. So I am not as versed in the Nemechek protocol, but we can have somebody to come on and talk about it, but it's pretty intense. Did you do the Nemechek protocol, Nancy? No, we did not. Okay. So I we'll get somebody. Was, yeah. I knew why it was Cation, um, allergic because of as a baby, he had a allergy to formula and we had to go on nutramogen because he colic. Generally, if your child colics terribly, that's a pretty sure sign that they have a dairy intolerance. 
Interesting. Interesting. I, you know, I was one of those militant breastfeeders that um, I, I was breastfeeding Jem and we did not allow him to have cow's milk until he was uh, over a year. And then, it, and I didn't, and I did not allow him to have wheat either because I was afraid of him being allergic. And at that time they were saying that if you keep food out of their diet, like peanut butter. When, when Jem was a baby, I was not allowed to have peanut butter while I was pregnant. And he was not allowed to have peanut butter as a baby because of the allergies in our family. At other times they've said, no, feed it to them when they're a baby so that they'll build up a tolerance to it. I don't know what they're saying right now, but we kept anything we thought he might be allergic to later on, we kept out of his diet for the first year. And I will say this, he was typically developing for the first year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then we did start giving him milk and uh, wheat. And that was when we started to see a difference. I don't think that that caused it, but I will say that we started to notice it then. Um, so anyway, I think there was another comment that it was. So Nemechek protocol, we will, I will have somebody come on and talk about the Nemechek protocol because it's pretty intense. Um and I, and I have not done it, although I know people who have done it, but I, I, I know a lot of people who looked at it and said, I, I'm not going to be able to do this. So there you go. Uh, well, we've, I've talked over you so much, uh, <laughs> Leah. So what, what, is there anything you want to end on with this? Cause then we will do our in the news, but, uh, last thoughts maybe. No, I mean, I think this is all great and you never talk over me. It's, it's always, it's a pleasure, um, to be here. Um, just that, you know, the takeaway, there are more GI issues in autistic individuals than the typically developing population. Your physician should not just say, oh, it's fine. It's ASD. That's just happens. There are solutions. Um, and you might see results behaviorally, language, whatnot, um, when you make folks feel better with, you know, when tummy issues, they suck. They just yeah. really hurt. Um, yeah. and, and so, and, and if you're interested in fecal transplants, if you're interested in anything that's kind of on the edge, experimental, um, please just make sure you're doing it responsibly. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is a great uh, option to look at clinical studies. Then you're both, you get the, to do, potentially do a fecal transplant and you get to help science. Woo! Yeah. And sometimes we get paid double woo. Um, and, and, you know, if that's something you're interested in, reach out to research at center We can help you transverse that world. Um, if there's any kind of questions you'd like to see as we um, come on, we come on every month. Um, I think December at the moment is probably going to be Karen Nolte, who's our head of research. Um, so don't miss that. She's wonderful. Um, she is my boss, so I have to say that, but she is actually wonderful. But she is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think um, I think we're going to be talking about bullying um, and instances of bullying, especially maybe cyberbullying right now because of um, remote school and things. Um, but if there's anything else you'd like us to talk about or if we get a lot of people asking for one thing, we might move that to January, whatnot. So um, okay. just write in, let us know. Um, and Shannon, Nancy, thank you so much for having me. It is such a thank pleasure. You. It's thank really lovely you. to be here. <laughs> It saves our bacon all the time to have you here. So, so wonderful to have you. Hey, thanks for watching Autism Live. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.